Today's episode is brought to you by Situational Awareness Matters simulation software, SamSim. SamSim is a branded version of the Sims You Share firefighter training software application, typically used for firefighter training, site inspections, promotional examinations, disaster and emergency pre-planning, business continuity, emergency plan testing, and more. If you're interested in getting your own copy, go to the SA Matters website, click on the store link, and then the simulation software link. If you've attended my Firefighter Safety Mistakes and Best Practices class, you've seen the Sam Sim software in action. I use it to demonstrate some very powerful training techniques for improving firefighter situational awareness in training and emergency incident scenes. Hello and welcome to episode 17 of Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. On this episode, I interview Indianapolis Fire Department Chief of Health and Safety, Doug Abernathy. Doug's career has spanned almost three decades, and on February 5th, 1992, he had a close call event that most unfortunately took the lives of two of his brother firefighters. In this episode, you'll learn about Doug's close call that involved tunnel vision and running out of air on the third floor of a nine-story hotel. You'll learn how he became disoriented and realized for the first time in his life that he might die in a fire. You'll learn how he was in shock and disbelief that he was actually carrying out downed firefighters. He'll tell you how his training saved his life. And at the end of the interview, reflections will be shared by Indiana State Fire Training Director John Buckman III. This is February the 5th downtown Indianapolis and back in 1992 we were having a lot of false alarms I mean I believe we had seven other runs that day and they were all false alarms to whether it be hospitals or schools or high-rise buildings of the sort and so a lot of us were feeling that here we go again feeling so as we leave the station it's really not far to the fire scene, the athletic club, where the alarm came in. I was the fifth person on engine 13, so I was kind of like the odd man out, but I was very comfortable with the crews in the downtown area, and so when I'm with them, I feel like I was the original part of that team. We walk into the athletic club from the Meridian Street side, and there's this rather large foyer. And as we look up, we can see heavy smoke ensuing from the vents. It's being pushed out from the vents, you know. We know we got a fire somewhere, a pretty good fire, because the smoke's coming out pretty dark. But there are a lot of people milling around in the, in the lobby area and all over the the ground level as we come in the building. I can remember seeing the um, maitre d' at the desk, you know, and I can hear a little faint alarm going off as we walk in, and, and we're in search mode. Everybody's looking for this fire. And we're pointing some people to the door because we know we got something. We just don't know where it is yet. As we search the first floor, we find nothing, and... Um, some people go to the basement and find nothing again, and about five minutes into it, um, someone comes down the stairs and says, hey, we found it up here. And so I can remember approaching the stairs in the center of this building, and keep in mind, the athletic club is a rather large facility. It has a, an actual athletic club in it with swimming pools and workout areas, gymnasiums but it also acted as a hotel and it also acted as a convention type center. So this is a big building. But as I approach that center stairwell to make my way up, I see something strange 
it was strange to me at the time. I see a, a line of people coming down the stairs. At first, they kind of you know threw me off a little bit. I said, "Wow, that's rather organized," because we don't usually see that kind of organization on people evacuating the fire scene. And then after a minute, I figured it out. Those were the Mike Tyson jurors. They had been sequestered in the athletic club during the trial. And the reason why they had security in the front and the back of them, they were maintaining their integrity as they left the structure. That was kind of neat to see. So we go up to the second floor. They say, no, it's up here. I go up to the third floor, and I, they said, it's right inside that room. And, you know, we all took our turns peeking inside there as we were setting up or attempting to set up our hose lines. We look inside these double doors inside what was called the McHale Ballroom. And I said, yeah, that's it. You know, heavy smoke and fire. We can see it inside there. It's rolling. And so now, you know, our job is to get some wet stuff on the red stuff. And, um, you know, we might have had a little tunnel vision. You know, because I can recall, as soon as we got to that third floor, I can see a hand line already stretched on the floor. And I said, wait a minute, we're the first engine crew who did that. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, the chief's aide, or EXO as we call him today, the guy that's driving the battalion chief found the fire. He attempted to make a quick knock on it by grabbing the hose out of the hose cabinet. Now, one of the first things they taught me in the training academy was never depend on the hose in the hose cabinet because you never know the integrity of that hose. And I saw I said, no, he didn't do that. Well, he did, and I kind of understand where he was coming from. He wanted to make a difference right away. But it looks like he came up just a little short. The hose cabinet didn't quite reach. The hose didn't quite reach. And so what we did was went back to the standpipe and attempted to make our connection, but we struggled for some reason. I had kind of like a stinger, which was a uh, a three-inch line, uh, excuse me, a two-and-a-half-inch line with a gated Y on it. And um, my officer had a, you know, a nozzle and some hose, and we attempted to make the connection in the standpipe. For some reason, we couldn't do it, and it didn't take us long before we realized that our threads were incompatible. Yeah. For some reason, in our inspections or lack thereof in the athletic club over all these years, we failed to notice that the standpipe hose or threads were not compatible with the hose that we were currently using or our couplings. And so we were kind of like, wow. All this fire in downtown Indianapolis, and we can't put the wet stuff on the red stuff from the standpipe. Well, we said, well, maybe we can make something else work. We put that cabinet hose back on the hose on on the um, standpipe and tried to connect on the tip of that hose. We removed the little plastic nozzle and tried to put our connection there. It didn't work. Out of frustration, I can remember this specifically, going back to that hose cabinet and doing something that I was taught never to do. You see, my father was a pipe fitter in the steel mills, and I learned how to cut thread as a child, and I knew the importance of never crossing my threads, but he told me, if you ever did it, do it well so it doesn't come off. <laughs> I had pretty good hand grip strength at the time, and so I got that on there. I got that um, inch and a half coupling on that connection and um, I got it on there real good. In fact, I can remember it being there two, three days after the athletic club. It was still in place. Well, anyway, we had water. We made entry into the McHale Ballroom with a hand line, and I'll tell you what, we knocked out some fire. It was beautiful. It's the stuff you dream of, you know. You go into a ballroom full of fire, smoke dark thick black smoke from ceiling to floor and we just knocked out every bit of fire we could find and lo and behold you know the atmosphere started clearing up and we thought we had that fire knocked it was so clear in that ballroom that we could see the street lights out 
of the windows. And it was, <laughs> it was like, wow. Now that's what I joined the fire department to do. Man, what a thrill. I was really feeling good about myself at that time. And I was really feeling good about the job we had just done. But also, my alarm began to go off. So I said, okay, now I'm doing engine work. I'm getting ready to change hats. It's time to start doing overhaul. We're going to do some truck work in a minute. But I am about to run out of air, and there's enough smoke in here that I'm going to need my, my um, tank. So I exit to leave the McHale Ballroom. And as I turn to leave the McHale Ballroom, I, I step away from the hose because, you know, I had visibility. And I remember the way I came up there. But as I exit the ballroom, something starts happening. I'm noticing the atmosphere is changing. It's starting to get dark again. And it's getting dark from the top down. I'm, I'm seeing the smoke thicken rapidly at my head level. Ironically enough, the lights were even still on. But now they're becoming occluded by the thick, dark smoke. And then somebody all of a sudden, which typically happens on every fire, somebody kills the power. So now the lights are turned off. You know, it's probably midnight or something of that nature. It's dark in this building already. When you add the smoke in it, it's really black. And um, it's time for me to get out of here. My alarm is going off. And it's funny how you remember things. All of a sudden, I can remember my safety check in the morning as I was checking out my gear. I remember that my flashlight batteries were out. So now the flashlight that I had in my pocket to guide me through the darkness was no good to me. I checked my equipment, but I didn't follow up and make sure I had fresh batteries. So now I realize I got to get out of here. Well, I was okay for a minute because I, I was always good in training on getting out of the situations. I was comfortable being blindfolded and crawling in the mazes. Well, this time it was a little different. As that smoke started banking down, it was hot smoke. It was very, it was heated to the point that, whoa, it was a little uncomfortable. I could feel it through my hood. And I said, whoa, I better drop down and, you know, do what they, what else they taught me to do is to crawl. I got down on my knees and as I got down on my knees, the smoke followed me down to the ground. And I started moving. I just started moving to get out of here. You know, I didn't follow that hose line out because it's, I knew we had connected into the standpipe on the fire floor, and it wasn't going to take me out. I was just going to walk out the way I came in, but now I'm crawling, and I can't see, and um, I actually became disoriented quite quickly to my amazement. You know, I for the first time in my life, something had occurred. I, I had that flashback they talk about, you know, when you are, death is impending and you see it coming. I realized for the first time in my life that, whoa, I can die here right now. It's coming. I can see it coming. If I don't get out of here, I'm dead. I saw that. I knew that. I kept crawling. I kept moving and I bumped into somebody another fireman and I recognized him you know I said hey who is this and, hey Dougie I said hey captain and all of a sudden I was no longer alone all of a sudden I I could breathe again it seems like and um, the fear kind of dissipated because there was someone else there with me. I wasn't alone anymore. And I could recognize the voice of Mike Spaulding, my captain. And I say, hey, captain, 
I'm about to run out of air here. Um, can you show me the way out? You know, I couldn't hear his alarm going off, so I knew he had plenty of air. My old Scott mask was rattling up a storm. My regulator was rattling heavily. And um, he says, well, Doug, yeah, I think I can show you out. Come on this way. We'll crawl with me. And um, I crawled with him. I think he didn't say me. He said, crawl with us. And I didn't see anybody else because I couldn't see anybody else. And the other person wasn't talking. So I crawled with them a little bit, and we bumped into a wall. And he said, well, Doug, I think it's close to here. I'll tell you what you're going to do. And, of course, he was a captain, so he spoke like a captain. He kind of tells you what you're going to do. And I was fine with that. He said, Doug, this is what I want you to do. I want you to crawl this way on the wall. And he puts my hand on the wall, and he points me in that direction. We're going to go this way. And let's see what we find. But I need you to go this way because that's where I feel it is. Now, the truth is, is I didn't want to leave him because with him, I darn near felt invincible. But that moment by myself already taught me that, boy, is this scary. But I did what he said. That's what we were trained to do. Listen to our officers. I listened. Lo and behold, I crawled in that direction about 20 feet, and with my with zero visibility, I could put my hand on this stair step and tell that it was the terrazzo floor that I had walked up on. I reached up with my other arm, and I was able to grab a banister that that old short-term memory kicked in and said, yeah, this is it. And I felt that from this point, I could find my way out. And... Um, you know, at that time, I could hear other things going on, you know, but I know that something else is happening. My, my rattle and my Scott mask is getting slower, and um, I know that I'm about to run out of air up here, so I'm, I holler a little bit, and I say, hey, guys, I got the stairs here. And it probably sounded more like, hey, guys, I got the stairs here. <laughs> you know how that smoke and that density and that mask it tends to mask your voice. I slapped my gloves on the ground a little bit, and I said, hey, I got to go. So I went down. I went all the way down to the first floor, and I actually walked out the way I came in, and I could have done it with my eyes closed because that's what we trained to do. And, and it got me out of that building. It was dark on the first floor. It was smoky on the first floor, too. But I went out on the Meridian Street side, and I saw Chief Feaster and Chief Williams out there, and they were pointing up at something. I couldn't see what they saw because they were pointing around the corner, but I changed my mask out. At that time, we didn't have TSUs or anything like that. There was a buggy there. We called it a bottle whack, and I got my bottle, I think I changed my mask out in record time, my, my bottle out, that is. And I went back inside the doors on the Meridian Street side. This time, when I walked in those doors, I could hear screaming. First, I didn't believe I was hearing screaming, but I listened a little further, and I realized they were coming from way upstairs. And um, what an experience that was. I anticipated that it might be my brothers or sisters up there struggling. So I made my way back to the stairs. As I made it to the second floor, I saw a firefighter that I know being assisted by another firefighter that I know. And I felt that situation was handled. Greg Gates was having an outer air situation, but Lieutenant Larry Speck was helping him get out. Lieutenant Speck had him, so I know he was in good hands. But the screaming was coming from upstairs. So I went up to the third floor. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I could see two firemen down on their knees over a downed firefighter. 
taking the tank off. And I asked him, what are you doing? Why are you taking off her tank? And I said, her, because the statue looked like that of a female firefighter that I worked with. I said, why are you taking off her tank? And they simply said, because she's out of air. Okay, that makes sense. And the extra weight of the tank from the third floor might be too much to deal with, so we removed her harness. And the three of us, um, Brad Pegalo, Chappie Watkins, and myself, attempted to carry this firefighter out of the building. Now, mind you, something had occurred while I was off those stairs, and it looked to be pretty drastic, but I wasn't completely aware of what had happened. As we were carrying her down these terrazzo stairs, we fell carrying this firefighter several times. We fell so hard sometimes that we thought we might have broke her. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable how we just couldn't carry one person out. Well, we didn't know it at the time, but the stairs had become glazed over. The smoke was so infused with a greasy type substance that that terrazzo floor was just like a skating rink and it was causing us to fall. And We fell several times, so much so that I lost my helmet and um, eventually came back in and found it later, but we carried her out. There was a door on the Vermont Street side, which was really right at the bottom of the stairs. I didn't realize it was there. I missed it because I had tunnel vision coming in. My situation awareness was not working for me at that time. But we carried her out a door directly at the base of the stairs, walked her right out. And there were other firefighters out there who started tending to her. And as we got her out, I realized I needed my helmet. And I go back in. And I go back into the second floor, and it was on the landing in between the second and the third floor. I ran into another group of firefighters carrying another firefighter out. And I said, oh, my gosh, what's going on? I'm in amazement I hear what happened. You know, I'd never seen, at that time with four years on, I'd never seen a firefighter hurt, let alone being carried out. We're going to take a brief break from our interview with Doug Abernathy so I can share with you some information about how you can attend a live event of Situational Awareness Matters or sign up for the online academy. If you're interested in attending a live event, you can check out the Situational Awareness Matters tour stop schedule at samatters.com. Click on the Program and Keynotes tab below the header, then click on the Events Schedule tab. If I'm in your area, I hope you'll consider attending a live event. If you're not able to attend a live event, consider signing up for the SA Matters Online Academy. The Academy contains videos and articles that cover the same content as the three-day live tour event delivered in 14 modules that you can go through at your own pace from your own computer. The Academy Plus version includes four books that are referenced throughout the Academy. The Plus version is a great bargain because the tuition simply covers the cost of the books, making the Academy free. Just click on the link below the header on the SA Matters homepage titled Online Academy. Okay, let's resume our interview with Doug Abernathy, the Health and Safety Chief for the Indianapolis Fire Department, as he talks about locating and removing his two fallen comrades. And this person was a lot bigger. It was Woody Galenius. And I tried to assist him carrying him out, and, uh, you know, we were all over him. We had him, you know, as our brother. We're carrying him down the stairs and we get him out. I had grabbed my helmet and um, Woody being a little bigger than, than Ann compared who was the other firefighter we carried out, those doors on the Vermont Street side were revolving doors. And we got stuck in those doors, you know, 
And, you know, you go back on your training and say, well, let's collapse those doors. Well, lo and behold, with the stress and with the emotions going on, we couldn't figure it out. And I can remember um, Lieutenant Jerry Montgomery from Engine 19, who always had a flathead axe with him, taking his axe, and he just totally destroyed these, these revolving doors, the, the metal framework, the glass, everything. And eventually we got Woody out. Um, my next image of Woody is being um, carted away on a cot with um, Job DeVasia doing CPR on him as that cot is moving as we load him up in the ambulance. And I'm in total disbelief still. I don't, what's going on? It's just, what, what happened? And um, I'm rather winded. I can remember going to sit on the curb, taking a couple of breaths, getting another cylinder put on my back when I hear that um, Mike Spaulding was down. That's the word I got. And that bothered me immensely. I, I think somewhere there was a camera shot of me screaming uh, out of frustration. I said, wait a minute. He just showed me the way out. He can't be down. Well, I, I get up. I'm ready to go back in again. This time I'm going to go up through the area, which is at a third story, sticking in a third story window, when I find out that they had just removed him out of another window by another area. And, um, you know, I could let go. I let go for a minute and I said, okay, that's good. But um, unbeknownst to me, what Mike had endured up there, he was with John Lorenzano, who was on his back step. John was my classmate. We had fought many fires together. And, um, you know, just the day before, the shift day before, I can remember John and his family. Well, the very first time I saw this at a firehouse, a fireman's family came to visit him. John had just had a new baby girl, a little Anne Marie. And um, his wife, Barb, had brought her by the firehouse. And in him, I saw something that I wanted. I saw the love that a father has for his, his family, his wife and his child. And it, it sparked something in me. Like him, you know, I had gotten married after I got on the job. And, um, you know, we hadn't, had, hadn't been blessed with children yet. But I saw something that I wanted. My brother, John, had it. I was so happy for him. And lo and behold, back on the third floor of the athletic club, after I had left down, I went one way on the wall. Mike Spaulding and John crawled the other way. As they were crawling in the other direction, they ran into Woody Galenius, who, as uh, Mike Spaulding could explain it, was having an out-of-air situation. His, his face piece was off, his helmet was off, and they pulled him down to the ground and attempted to get Woody out when something occurred. Everything that was above their heads came down on top of them. You see, this building, the athletic club, when it was originally built, was built with high ceilings. Well, by the time we had gotten there on this athletic club fire, it had added additional ceilings. And you say, why did you add ceilings? Well, every renovation that came along every 10, 20, 30 years, instead of removing those ceiling tiles that were placed up there with the five pads of glue, you know, you can see one in each corner and one in the center, those 12 by 12 ceiling tiles, they just stick them up there. Well, it would be too costly to scrape all that off and recondition that ceiling. Let's just put another ceiling in. And that's what they did. 
And over the years, they had performed that task three different times. So unbeknownst to us, the fire we thought we had put out in the McHale Ballroom was raging in the large void spaces up above our heads. And it is believed that the flashover occurred in those void spaces and brought everything down on top of us when flashover had occurred. We're talking intense temperatures. Broke down all that building material and brought it down on top of us. Brought it down on Mike, Woody, and John. And um, Mike Spaulding fell one way, ended up suffering some pretty severe burns, and in an attempt to hit the emergency button on the radio, he took his glove off. We had just gotten these new radios with the little emergency button. To hit it, he felt he needed to remove his glove, and he took his glove off to push that button, and he never got it back on. Mike suffered some pretty severe burns to his hands and his head and his back, his arms, different areas of his body. But he kind of fell into a little kitchen area up there. Woody ended up laying right where they, where they fell. John, my classmate, mind you, they were in the hallway when this collapse occurred, John got up and moved. Somehow, John unfortunately ended up back in the McHale ballroom where the fire started, close to the windows, maybe about four feet from a window. We found him curled up in the fetal position inside the McHale Ballroom after it was all said and done. Now, I know John. I fought fire with him. You know, I told you about my flashback. Can you imagine what his flashback was like, you know, seeing his family and his daughter? You know, my flashback took me back to my dog, Laddie, and my wife and my brothers and sisters and my parents, and I lived through it. I can only imagine what his was like. Mike Spaulding was carried out by some brothers and sisters on the east side of the building. We found John hours later after going back in, searching several times. But we lost two strong brothers that day, injured many others. And um, to this day in my life, that was 20 plus years ago, I've never had a more transitional moment. You see, it taught me something about fire that I never knew, that I was taken for granted. For the first time in my career, now I'd been on four years, and that's not a long time, but we were fighting a lot of fire. You know, I had some days where we fought two, maybe three fires in a day. I was really feeling confident about what I was doing and the people I was doing it with. But all of a sudden, I learned how dangerous that job really was. All of a sudden, for the first time, I did not want to see fire anymore. It changed my mind. You see, up until that point, I was in a, in a mindset, boy, I hope we get one today. Boy, I can't wait to get that fire. Oh, I missed one. I went to lunch and I missed one. You know, you hated that stuff. I was gung-ho for fire. You see, I never looked at fire as something that would ruin someone's life or take someone's life. I looked at it as a challenge, something to be defeated. I never looked at it as the true killer that it was. And now for the first time in my life, first time in my career, I didn't want to see fire anymore. I realize now that it can wait. And when I see it, I'm going to do my job. But until then, I'm not in a rush for a fire ever again in my life. There was an atmosphere on the fire department after that. It kind of changed all of us. 
it changed our entire fire department and many of the communities around us. It didn't just affect IFD firefighters. It affected firefighters throughout the Midwest and the nation. I'd never been to a firefighter's funeral before, but oh my goodness, what a beautiful thing to behold for such a tragic event. I was not expecting that either. We had thousands of firefighters there on a sub-zero temperature day dressed in their, cl in their class blue, class A uniforms, and it was beautiful as we said goodbye to our brothers. But I realized too, now that's something that you don't want to see. So what IFD had to do is figure out how we can make changes. And I'm here to tell you today that we've made a lot of changes. We needed to find out a way to train our firefighters to recognize the phenomenon of flashover. We ended up shopping around. We searched the entire country and the world over for something that would teach us this. You see, all of a sudden, we had a lot of support, not just from other firefighters, but from the community. It's funny how such a tragic event gave everyone a greater awareness to what we do. And all of a sudden, monies and funding became available and uh, we were able to locate the sweet survival system and start training in flashover behavior, fire behavior in the phenomena called flashover. We also bought a flameover prop that would simulate that, and we began training our firefighters in that phenomena. It also helped us, in a sense, bring FDIC to town, Fire Department Instructors Conference, we changed our SCBAs, we changed our turnout gear, we changed our SOPs and general orders. One of the chiefs on that run, Chief Clyde Feaster, wrote a book, wrote a guide, the High Rise Operations Guide that's been used by several cities and countries around the world as a beginning, as a door opener to understanding how to do things right on a high rise to the best of your ability. You see, we made some mistakes. Some mistakes can't help to be made in such a situation. But our goal was to learn as much from that incident as possible so that as we move forward as a fire department, we can prevent this from ever happening again. I look back on that day as a multifaceted transition for me. Um, personally, what did it do for me from that day on? It opened up my eyes. It opened the eyes of this blind man and allowed me to see what I should be doing. I've been blessed. Somehow the Lord works things out like this. I've been blessed to be a part of our training division. After the fire, Maybe a year or two I had injured myself and that detailed me to training. I got a chance to work with a recruit class and I was able to express some of my passion both for the job and both for doing the job right to them. One of my chiefs taught me flashover instructing. He made me a flashover instructor so I was blessed to be able to teach the phenomena of flashover to all of IFD and many beyond. Training became my thing because of the disaster of the athletic club fire because it taught me that we can never be over prepared for what we do. There are so many inherent dangers in our job that we must constantly be vigilant with our training because if we fail to let our training teach us, then we fail not just ourselves, but our communities. So we train on IFD, and we share training with others. We've taken training from others around the country, around the world. At this very moment, I'm in a training class. And I, I will keep training 
and sharing and learning from others because every piece of knowledge we gain through training and share makes a difference. Thank you for listening. What uh, out there listening is a new firefighter who's been on four years or less, who is anxious for the fire, wants the worker, doesn't want to miss it, is full of enthusiasm. And if you could offer him any wisdom, him or her, any wisdom based on your years of experience and what you've been through and what you've seen your department go through after this tragic loss. What would you tell this young firefighter? I'd say, for me, is remember your training and depend on it. And if you feel that you're not getting enough training, you're probably right. Don't be afraid to go above and beyond to gain knowledge in this deed of firefighting because there's knowledge out there. Seek it out. You know, sometimes we're told, well, you're a rookie on the job, all you need is some experience. Or some of us aren't getting a lot of experience out there. Fires just aren't occurring as much as they used to. I've seen a drastic change in my career, and it's even more so true for the young firefighter coming on today. So how does he protect himself and his peers? He trains with them. He trains for them. He trains for his family so that he can come home because they must know now that they are the most important person on the fire ground. And to maintain and understand that importance, we have to keep training. There are a lot of things we did wrong on that fire that had we had some training or recognition, we might have been able to make a difference. We might have been able to save one of those two lives. Your training can lead you out. If I think back on it, as I think back on it, my training brought me out of that building even when I thought it failed me memorizing the floors I was on, memorizing every turn that I made. As I went into that building, I was able to get out of that building in zero visibility. That was training. Keep training. Training is a big thing for me. You know, I've been blessed to be a training instructor and been trained by some of the best in the world. And I I still lean heavily on training Good. and share it with others. Good. Doug, thank you for taking some time to sit down with me and share this amazing, amazing story. Uh, Chief Buckman, uh, have you heard this before? No. Um, I, I, I read, the pay, read the report because at this, the next day we had the uh, plane crash in Evansville, the C-130 crashed into the Drury Hotel. So two major events in Indiana, which, uh, so they were, they were interrelated. But um, I've, I've never heard his story, and I would tell you, emotional, high, high power, and uh, it will make a difference. The people who listen to this will learn from this. You will influence their decisions, and it will be influencing them for the better. So, uh, again, thank you for sharing. You can, see, you can tell... Um, it still, still, still impacts you. Yeah. Um, no matter what, and it will, it will always be with you. But I think also, and I, and I remember the report. And like any event, there are challenges, but you did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And if you wouldn't have done those right time, right things for the right reason at the right time, it could have been worse. So you have confidence in yourself that you did the right thing and you saved other firefighters' lives. Well, the most inspiring thing about it is how Indianapolis took that event as a springboard to make so many changes. 
John, you know, you, you travel around, you see it. I travel and I see it. The apartments that have critical injuries or line of duty deaths and change nothing. Right. Change nothing. They, it's like they're in denial. Or if they change something, it'd be like, well, then we would be admitting that we did something wrong. And then even, John, when you were speaking to the class today, you talked about an incident where, where um, firefighters got killed, five of them, and they interviewed the chief, and he said, well, I, I do the same thing the same way again. You know, just like in total denial of anything that went wrong and how to fix it. And that is not at all what happened in Indianapolis. I mean, you guys just went and took those lessons and said, this is going to be a, um, a pinnacle moment for our organization. Well, you, you had two people. You, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if you mentioned Chief Smith, Keith yeah, Smith, who Keith was Smith. the fire chief. Oh. He never liked the status quo. Right. He always wanted to be improving and asking the tough questions. And you also had, I forgot, Chief Feaster, yes. who was the incident commander, who you talked about his high-rise training package, yes. or high-rise policy and procedure package that he wrote, yes. his training package, which was adopted in many, many urban cities, cities around the country. Uh, you had two just high-quality firefighters who remembered the street but realized their responsibility as a chief is to make this thing better. It's, it's a tragedy. It's a catastrophe. We made some errors. We could have done some things different. Let's share it. And you had two chiefs that stood up and said, we want to share. So yeah. Yeah. hats off for them. Yeah, Keith Smith, he... Um I can remember him telling us, when you get this training up and going, we want I want you to share it. You share it with anybody who wants it. And at that time, he gave us carte blanche to go above and beyond IFD to share that training. And, um, you know, he opened up that door of opportunity. He didn't want to just keep it here in Indy. He wanted to make sure that everybody who needed it and wanted it could get that training. And... Um, I think it had something to do with the uh, FDIC coming to Indianapolis, us opening the doors to it and uh, being embraced and still being here 22 years later. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you to both of you um, for uh, sitting down with me and, and sharing the, the lessons and, John, your perspective on this uh, as well. So um, for, the, for the listeners out there, it's so critical for us to uh, learn from – tragedy learn and share and grow and doug in your position now as the chief of health and safety i know you're giving back i saw your passion all week for uh for firefighters and keeping them safe and and how many times you talked about the brothers and the sisters and the presentation that you guys were given on turnout gear replacement and it was it was it was pretty inspiring for me and and uh pr prior to the class this week i didn't know you so the uh the the gift for me of being here this week was that uh, I made a new friend. Wow, that was one compelling interview. Thank you, Doug, for taking time to share that with us. And thank you, John Buckman, for sitting in and sharing your reflection and perspective on this tragic loss at the Athletic Club Hotel Fire, February 5th, 1992. Well, that's it. Episode 17 is complete. Thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I sincerely appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. If you like the show, please go to iTunes and search for SA Matters Radio and subscribe to the podcast and leave your feedback in a five-star review. This will help others to find the show. You can also sign up for the free SA Matters monthly newsletter by visiting samatters.com and clicking on the red box on the right side of the home page. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.